Hi everyone, this is Andre with episode number eight of the localization podcast. This one actually took me a little while for me to press the recording because I'm in a very special environment. It's uh, Tuesday, it's 10.45 p.m. and I'm actually uh, staying uh, with my mom's Airbnb and she's sleeping right next door. So for me, (laughs) starting this recording uh, actually took a lot of time. You know, I was delaying things, I was trying to do other things, I was trying to prepare myself, I did like a couple of tests. Uh, But here I am, and um, it's usually, as you probably know from your own experience, once you take the first step, the fear usually goes away. So now I'm feeling more confident and comfortable just talking while I know uh, that she's in the room next door. And she's probably trying to sleep, but... Uh, I got the permission to do this recording, so here I am. Uh, It's Tuesday, and as I mentioned in episode 7, which I just released earlier today at 10 a.m., I had a couple of more articles left uh, from the preparation that I did for the previous week, uh, because for episode 7, I only included two articles, and it already took me one hour to cover them all. So I just decided to release that. And here I am uh, going to going back to the articles that I had left. And I'm very actually happy that I took this action right after releasing the podcast. Uh, because also, um, well, first of all, I want to do more content. Uh, without overthinking things too much, like jump right in, into it uh, as I finish my work uh, duties. And then the second thing is that as I'll be going to Philippines, maybe I will need some time to adjust, which is probably just an excuse right now. Um, but this will kind of give me like a backup option and I can actually do the editing on the flight to Philippines. So we are three minutes in and I forgot to mention two disclaimers. One of them is uh, if you are new to the podcast, consider this uh, as my speaking practice. And that was one of the reasons why I decided to uh, start this podcast. Um, And basically what I do here is that I go over the news uh, on Slater.com and also on posts across different social media. In my recent episode, it's been mainly Twitter and LinkedIn that's very productive on new content that different companies share. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm kind of like a scavenger from... Star Wars. What was the name? The 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 new chick. I forgot her name. Um, yeah, whatever. So that's what I'm doing. I'm scrapping the uh, the the internet for relevant and interesting content that also teaches me something, and I'm here to share that with you, and hopefully you'll get something out of it as well. And always, I try to provide my commentary, Um, either I agree with it or I disagree with it, and I try to add something on top of it, especially if I have a certain experience uh, in that area, so that I don't just reread someone else's comment. So I guess that's it for the intro. Uh, Let me look at my list of articles that I have. And I have one, two, three, four, five articles uh, left. And I'll start with the one uh, which is posted uh, by a new company that we haven't had in the podcast yet. And it's called 
phrase.com and this is from their blog and the blog post is about a day in the life of a software localization engineer. So for me, for, the, for those of you that haven't checked my profile on LinkedIn or that haven't worked with me, I actually started my career as a localization engineer in Moravia. That was a long, long time ago. I think I was 20 or maybe 21. I think I was in the second year of my university studies in Brno and I just ended up, I was just basically looking for uh, any entry level job. And at the time I was studying computer science. So I wanted to do something maybe like programming, uh, like a software engineer or something like that. But then I somehow ended up in the basement of this uh, Czech company called Moravia. And because they had like a peak period, there were just two candidates for a job and they hired two of them. Uh, I don't think they even paid much attention to the tests. So I got my job and uh, I started working as a, I think the first thing that I was doing, I was faking some screenshots uh, for some Chinese company or something like that. And then I was moved into the Microsoft group where I was working on what was I working on? I was working on definitely on Windows Vista, then I was working on Windows Server, I think 2008. And then another Windows Server. And that was basically three years of my life in Moravia. And after that, I quit the company. So for me, this blog post will be uh, pretty much kind of like uh, the memory of my own uh, first experience with localization. And I'm trying to think if we had any significant engineers at Lionbridge. So at Lionbridge, no, I don't actually remember because like the whole team that was working on the account that I was transitioning was full of PMs. But in Autodesk engineers were heavily, heavily uh, involved because uh, we were doing full software localization of all their main products. So that role was quite uh, critical. But anyway, let's start with the article. Okay, so um, what exactly does a software localization engineer do? In a nutshell, a software localization engineer takes apart all the elements of software that are to be localized and puts them back together once the localization is done. I think that's a pretty accurate description, simplified, but that's about it. So this was the introduction. Now they're going into the actual tasks that they do. So preparing for localization, the first step you would take in a localization project assigned to you is to check if the software has been sufficiently internationalized to enable the localization. The source code of the software should be separate separated from all localizable elements so that you can extract them easily. So um, from what I remember, the experience in Autodesk was that the internationalization part would usually be done by the localization engineers at Autodesk because they were more experienced um, and they had better, uh, I mean, closer collaboration with the dev team. And I think like, maybe I'm wrong here, but to me, internationaliz internationalization is mostly important, like at the beginning, where the dev teams are like, kind of like trying to work towards their first localization. So you need to be there to uh, set up the rules and basically educate them on what needs to be done so that the software is easier to localize. Then hopefully, once these rules are in place, they will be able to follow them and you will have less trouble. So you will have less effort in the internationalization. 
department. So the next step is extraction. So you will pull out all files with translatable text and any other elements, for example, images that need to be localized. These are then compiled into a localization toolkit for translate translators together with instructions for translation. So this is a tricky part. Uh, because mm, that need to be localized. Uh, so when it comes to the toolkit and instructions for toolkit for for translation, um, I don't actually have that experience where localization engineers would be actually compiling the instructions for translate translation translators. It's usually the project manager. I mean, I'm pretty sure like that the engineer can provide some valuable information. But he usually just passes the information to the PM who should be the last person to uh, compile the final instructions for translation. And also extraction. Um, I'm just thinking of saying that this is something that happens usually automatically um, using the the cat tools or if you have like some APIs in place. So or maybe some scripts. Uh, so this is more of a I think this is actually kind of like related to the internet internationalization uh, that we talk about right before that, because if you have that set correctly, and you know what to expect, and from where to grab the, uh, the strings for translation, uh, then the extraction would be pretty much automated. Okay. Uh, toolkit is so once the toolkit is handed over, it's time to sit back and relax. No, not really. Your translators might need some support in the process. And this is, mm, this is actually, this reminds me of uh, how the role distribution worked in Moravia, because in Moravia, the localization leads and even the engineers were actually sending the handoffs to translators or to translation vendors on their own. And I think I have never seen such a model in any other company, it's usually the PM who dispatches the uh, the handoffs and everything. But in Moravia, it was uh, the engineering team, actually. So when I was working there as an engineer, and you know, I was as, as soon as I kind of like felt for the first time, like confident, like about my skills and what I can do, I started to 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 get more cocky. And I was like, asking myself, you know, like, what actually do the uh, freaking PMs do, you know, like, because like, we got the files from from the client, which at that time was Microsoft, we prepared everything, we analyzed um, uh, the source files, then we just passed the word counts to the PMs, and they said, Okay, please split it this way and send it to these and these people. And then give them give them these deadlines. And then we would uh, prepare a thing. And we would send it to for translation for all the languages. And then uh, once the translations were complete, we would put it back into the into the into the build, or we would deliver the translations, and then it would go to testing, and then we would fix the defects, you know, so like, I felt like like the engineering team in Moravia was like, pulling all the weight. And like the PMs, I felt were like, kind of like administrators, although they were probably uh, getting a lot more money for the job than we were. But anyway, I would actually be interested if there are any other companies that have this uh, role distribution. I'm not even sure if Moravia still has this thing. Or maybe if it was just at the time. 
Uh, anyway, so going back to the article, I got sidetracked once again. Uh, the next thing that you do is you support the translation. So that's kind of like what I was uh, sharing from my own experience is that you likely need to answer a few query queries from translators. Maybe they need clarification on a particular element, or there's a problem with their localization tool that needs immediate attention. So uh, when you get a bit of room in your schedule, it's the right time to update and optimize the translation memory, a database that stores previous translations for later use and translators rely heavily on to increase speed and consistency. So two things. Supporting? Yes, definitely. <sighs> Although, <laughs> I know that like, again, going back to Moravia, I know that we were supporting the translators like a lot with the queries. And if I'm not mistaken, maybe even the engineers were again, the ones uh, managing the, the, the queries. And we were like, if we couldn't answer them on our own, or the PMs couldn't, then we would ask or like escalate back to the client or the dev team to see if they can answer it. Again, this is something that I don't think it's happening in other companies. I don't think that actually engineers would be involved in query management. Unless of course, the PM is the first point of contact for the queries. And maybe if the PM feels that the query is like quite technical, and the LE could answer it, then they would be contacted. But I think in Moravia, the engineers were the first point of contact, especially since as an engineer, and if we're strictly speaking about software, you probably know a lot more about the software and the individual strings, and you have more know how to do some research about like, where this string would appear in software and stuff like that, <clears throat> compared to a PM. Anyway, I need some drink and I'm actually drinking Stella that was left here in this Airbnb. So it's a free drink. I can't resist. And so the second part of the of the supporting of the supporting role, according to the article was updating and optimizing the translation memory. So this, um, this seems kind of like it's like something that was happening like in the 20th century, <laughs> where we didn't have all these PMSs and all these cloud solutions. So I'm not even sure like if LEs would manually have to update TMs uh, in this age. And what the hell does even optimizing the translation memory mean? I have no idea. Do you just press like some button and something happens? I don't know. But this really seems like a filler thing just to put something in this paragraph. It's definitely not something uh, critical, I would say. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Next is building and testing the localized product. So this is where you put everything together, you integrate the translated files into the software to create a new localized version of it. When done correctly, the software should speak a new language. <sighs> now comes somewhat tedious but critical task of the job testing the new version of the software, one error in the code and the software can look broken. A wrong translation of a call to action button, and the user is put off immediately. If you enjoy finding and fixing bugs, then you're at the great advantage here. So I'm not sure <clears throat> in which company actually the LE does testing as well. <clears throat> because in my experience, again, you probably want to separate the people who are testing things from the people who are fixing things. Testing, usually you want to look at it from the end user perspective. While the people who are fixing stuff, they want to have a deep knowledge of 
what's inside a box. <clears throat> so I don't actually see LEs as testers of localized product. But maybe if the product is like small, maybe, but still, I would say that it should be done by someone else. <clears throat> and then the last part here is and this is uh, this is the last part about what exactly does a software localization engineer do. And so the last part is standardizing the process. <clears throat> and so this is just like a general blah blah about streamlining localization by standardizing the process and establishing consistency through terminology management, glossaries and style guides. So blah, blah, blah. So <clears throat> I think standardizing the process is everyone's duty. Uh, so of course, and as an engineer, you would do it for the engineering processes, but this is not like the core of your task. And my throat is drying again. Oh, no. So the next question still within this article, what are the daily challenges of a software localization engineer? <clears throat> Fixing bugs and errors. <sighs> Files get corrupted, small errors sneak into the code, and suddenly nothing is working anymore. Having a knack for experimenting, troubleshooting and persistent problem solving definitely come in handy here. So yeah, um, again, from my Moravia experience, I think when we were doing Windows Vista, I think into, I think it was more than 10 languages, maybe 12 languages, I don't remember right now. <clears throat> and at some point you get, I think we had like, I don't know, maybe even up to 1000 defects. <clears throat> and we were really, it was actually kind of like a, I think I hate probably hated it at that point. Uh, because like, it was too much like I was working serious <clears throat> over time when I was um, doing the lead engineering lead part on Windows Vista. <clears throat> and we had to deal with all these bunch of languages, but we eventually like optimized the process pretty well. <clears throat> and then what I remember is that the team that was working on, I don't remember what was their product, it was the other Microsoft team. And they had these really great idea, which they called I think it was called targeting. So we were working working in biweekly cycles, I think during Vista. So that was that was quite hardcore. <clears throat> so you would get new build, you would prepare the I think it was called Log Studio packages, <clears throat> you would send them for translation, you would separate the linguistic defects, and you would send them all to the translation teams. So they would have to translate and also fix the linguistic defects. <clears throat> and because at that time, there was no cloud solution or anything. So it means the ownership of the EDB that was the file format back then for Log Studio, the ownership was with with the translator, so we couldn't fix the technical issues. But what this team came up with was that <clears throat> you could still do the investigation of where you would need to fix the defects, and you would just note down the resource ID and the string. And so once you got the files back from the translators, you would, you wouldn't have to do the <clears throat> investigation from that point, you would already be prepared, and you would know where to fix it. So fixing would go much, much faster. <clears throat> and yeah, and when it comes to fixing, I also remember the funny part was I remember this very well. <clears throat> we were actually fixing like a defect on a Windows Media Player. <clears throat> and I think we just like saw like some screenshot and you would like need to work work out a magic and like identify like what exactly you need to change in in lock studio. <clears throat> and I remember that in lock studio as like a source string, we only had like a couple of numbers. And I <laughs> so this is me bragging bragging about my 
uh, bug fixing skills, I was the one who kind of like um, thought that like the, the the numbers in the string actually represent like a position or something like that, or a certain string where it starts. So we would actually had to fix the the bug by actually changing the value of the the coordinates. <clears throat> So typically, like when you have like a number, you usually don't localize it. But this time we had to sort of localize it to basically move the the target string. And yeah, this was Windows Media Player. So <clears throat> uh, I was kind of happy that I was working on something that I'm actually using. Although everybody says that Windows Vista was not the good one, that Microsoft does a good OS every second release. <clears throat> but I'm still very happy that I worked on that project. <clears throat> Going back to the article. So that was fixing bugs and errors, uh, balancing the technical and non technical side. So this is uh, you find yourself in between developers and translators with the challenge to let the workflow smoothly from one to the other and back. <clears throat> Translators typically won't understand code, so you might have to explain technical terms and issues to non technical people. <clears throat> yep, I, I agree with this. <clears throat> and this is actually where it helps if you uh, I'm going to use the word empathy because Gary V uses the word empathy a lot. And if you have empathy for <clears throat> people who don't understand tech too much, and you can explain it to them in a very dummy way so that they understand. <clears throat> and I have to admit that sometimes I lose patience with people who don't understand tech too much. The last thing here is working with remote teams. Uh, is there anything interesting here? You work with people in different time zones, that's normal, your communication and coordination skills might be stretched, blah, 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 okay, nothing important. And here we go. Next part, what skills should a software localization engineer have? You should understand the code. <clears throat> kind of, but I don't think it's a mandatory thing. But yeah, it definitely helps. Okay, so let's 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 keep it there. Uh, understand the code, know the right tools. So it's a big plus when you're already comfortable using TMS, uh, get tools, CMS systems, translation memories and quality assurance tools. That is probably true, Alice should be the masters of the tools. Pay attention to the detail. The devil is in the details when it comes to software localization. A bug in the code or a wrong translation can make the company look unprofessional. And I guess it's your duty to discover this. But I already talked about it, I think it's more for the QA people. Next thing, solve problems. Everybody has to solve problems. So I guess that's normal. Communicate and work in team. Again, this is, I think, uh, what everybody needs to do anyway, these days. Localization is a lot about team collaboration. Yes, thank you. We know that. Wrapping it up. Uh, so finally, we're at the end. I'm just going to read this because this is like the final paragraph of this article. Software localization engineer is an exciting, highly sought after role. <clears throat> if you love to solve problems, are not intimidated by new technology, and can handle the technical as well as the non technical side, then you likely thrive in this role. You can learn a lot about different languages, cultures and how software is shaping the world. Yep, that's that's nice. So before we go away from this company because it's their first time it's their debut 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 uh, on the podcast <clears throat> i'm going to have a quick look at their website so their website is phrase.com so very easy and i had no idea what they do they have actually very nice uh icon on the page i think it's like a parrot or something but anyway, let's look at their value proposition, what these guys actually do. So they say, they're making localization work. <clears throat> Time to say goodbye to huge translation spreadsheets, 
lengthy email communication, broken language files, too little context, intransparent process, held back releases and everything else that can make localization a pain. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to scroll down because right now I'm confused about what it actually is. So it's everything you need to boost your localization. Uh, phrase is the place where localization teams come together to release translations faster and easier than ever before. Okay, so it's kind of like a like, a, is it like a TMS? Probably no, but um, kind of like that end to end localization in cloud. Uh, so what I do is API integrations, translation editor, and quality checks. They offer a better localization experience for everyone. Okay, here it is phrases a translation management solution. Okay, so I was actually right. Build with the whole team in mind developer manager translator. Okay, so I don't know like what actually makes them different. But I do like their website. Uh, let me look at the features. Oh, actually, no. Oh, maybe yes. Okay, features. I'm going into features. Built to relieve your localization pain. Discover why localization no longer needs to be an issue by experiencing phrase, the most cutting edge localization solution on the market. Okay. <clears throat> big words, big words. <sighs> so phrase is developer centric. Phrase has a strong focus on addressing developer needs. For us, this means a fast and reliable import and export of language files, versatile API, a dedicated CLI tool, support for over 40 plus file formats, branching functionalities in phrase and a whole lot more. <clears throat> Getting things done. Organize all your software translation projects in the form of jobs directly in phrase. Okay, I like that. That's more for managers. We speak your format. Uh, they support tons of localization file formats across platforms and programming languages. Faster translation workflow. Rapidly built production ready integrations with modern tools from React components to real time web hooks. <clears throat> I'm looking at their screenshot and it looks pretty nice. Actually, it looks kind of like SDL's language cloud. I know that actually, <laughs> surprisingly, one of our LEs was showing me that today. But this one looks more visual. I like the progress bars. Uh, so yeah, and they also have more than 1000 customers. <clears throat> I'm just quickly going to look at pricing. Pricing. Okay. Oh, here we go. So they have three plans light plan <clears throat> is 160 bucks a month. Uh, pro plan is for modern software development teams, localization teams and global brands and it's 462 a month. An exclusive one is with salary service level agreement and it's 1020 a month. I'm not sure if okay, okay, so it's for 15 users. <clears throat> I know that I discovered one similar like continuous localization solution before on the podcast, but I already forgot their name. Anyway, I'm going to uh, mark this article as complete. So that was the first article. And <clears throat> as I mentioned in the previous episode, I think it is my goal to actually start the first topic with like the most interesting one. And actually also just to share with you today, I kind of like did a new version of thumbnails. So instead of the thumbnail just showing mostly me and then the, the localization podcast and which episode it is. This time I want to focus I want to make um, the <clears throat> like the main topic 
um, stand out the most. So the biggest title in the thumbnail will be uh, the the main topic of the podcast, <clears throat> and then I made the uh, the name of the podcast, so the localization podcast, uh, a bit smaller. So this one will be definitely about engineering because we are getting into forty minutes. And I mean, I was still talking about that, but I really enjoy this because I I I started as a localization engineer, and to this day, I think like all that technical experience that I had, and even my programming uh, experience that I had during the first three years at university and then I left because like I said like okay I, I don't want to be a developer I want to be more like a manager it all kind of like pays off uh, in in future you know so um, I guess my advice would be not advice just like observation would be that um, don't ever regret if you learn something new uh, because you don't know when you're going to need it Okay, moving on to the second article, I have four articles left. I should try to be more faster. But hmm, once I start talking, it's difficult for me to stop. (laughs) Okay, so the second article is from a company, it's again a newcomer. They're called dynamic language.com. And this article is about chatbot and localization. So I know we already had one, I think it was a Slater article. It was in one of the earlier episodes of the localization podcast. <clears throat> and it was about chatbots. And I know there, I, and I also remember there was like this, in, I think it was Indonesian startup, Holosis or something like that, that had has this virtual assistant in English and Bahasa. And it's doing pretty, pretty well. So I think this article is more, uh, more uh, generic, like what are chatbots and how they can help you save cost and get better ROI. So let's get into it. There are, there are like a couple of statistics here from different researches. So I really like this one. That's why I picked it. So I think most of the time I will be just quoting what the article said. So the first thing, important question is building a multilingual chatbot worth it? As an HBR, I guess that's Harvard Business Review article notes, deployments are most likely to pay off in companies fielding thousands of customer chats or calls via contact centers with hundreds of agents. Multilingual chatbot works best in this environment for two reasons. Number one, such contact centers have masses of transcripts and therefore masses of data to train a multilingual chatbot that makes it easier for the chatbot to solve customer needs. Number two, Developing a multilingual chatbot and then deploying it takes months. It pays off best for companies with large scale operations, and they can reap the benefits more quickly. Uh, So uh, this is again, this is again, a good, a good point, which which we covered several times while talking about NMT, which was, I think, most of the episodes, because almost every week, there was at least one article on Slater about NMT. And so MT gets better with the data. And the more data you feed it, the smarter it gets. I guess that's my amateur uh, observation of this. And so, 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 yeah, I actually haven't thought of this before. With all these, like, you know, like, you have to have a lot of data to train the machine. 
I'm thinking like, what if you were like a smaller player that doesn't have like all these data? Like, will there be like some <clears throat> companies that will like develop like some generic a uh, solution that would still that could still be usable for majority of the smaller or medium sized businesses that don't have like a lot of data to train uh, the chatbot. I mean, like, like, would the hmm, like would the hmm, hmm. Well, I don't I don't know anything about like machine learning. So this is me just asking stupid questions. But um, like, what is the difference? Like, if, if I'm like a customer, and I'm asking about like, hey, like, is this available in this, this and this and store? And like, in what sizes is this available and stuff like that? Like, does it actually matter? Like what the product is about? Like, could there be a place for like, uh, general or like generic chatbot that could handle like different types of products, like whether you were selling, I don't know, cosmetics, or you're selling clothes. Uh, <clears throat> does the nature of the questions that the customers ask differ? Like, they would be asking like about payment options, like I want a refund or something like that. Yeah, so that's that's my idea. <laughs> Uh, that's my idea. Okay. And so what can multilingual chatbots automate for your business? And this is we're going back to the article. Each year companies spend 1.3 trillion on 265 billion customer service calls, according to IBM. That's fucking huge. What's even more incredible is that IBM estimates chatbots can reduce customer service costs by 30%. They can achieve that by one, answering up to 80% routine questions and issues, two, freeing up customer service agents for more complex tasks, three, improving to deal with more and more issues. Wait, what? Okay, um, some analysis firm Juniper Research predicts between 75 to 90% of customer queries will be handled by chatbots by the early to mid 2020s. So yeah, I mean, this is like the whole uh, idea of automation, right? Like, if you have like routine questions, and I'm pretty sure like most of the support centers, I have never worked in any one of those thank God, maybe or maybe not, because I would have like extra experience. But I guess it's pretty scripted, like, and even if it's not scripted, then you're probably doing it wrong. Because like, if you well, you're, you're probably not dealing with the same with I'm uh, sorry, you're probably not dealing with new issues all the time. <clears throat> so you can kind of like fine tune your answers every time uh, you get a very similar request. It's the same as like, uh, <laughs> approaching girls like in public places. First time you may get like, uh, uh, totally rejected, but then maybe you change the way you approach them like from where you come, do you smile, do you not smile, how you dress, what you say. And then what she says, then what you respond and blah, 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 and stuff like that. Not that I'm an expert at this topic, but <laughs> I read a couple of things. So I assume that customer support works in a very similar way. Uh, because there's not that many different scenarios that the customers can come up with. Especially there's probably like some battle curve, is it called bell curve, where most of the, let's say, uh, yeah, let's use the part 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 or part or rule the 8020 rule. And let's say that 80%. Oh, which by the way, matches the the number in the article. Let's say that 80% of the customer questions 
uh, are the same. No, <laughs> no, oh, no, it would be 80% of your customers ask 20% of the questions. Wait, what? Uh, no, doesn't make sense. <laughs> okay, I cannot fit it in. But I, I hope you know what I mean. Like majority of the questions will be probably the same or very similar. And then there will be like a couple of outliers where you actually need like that agent who can do like some extra digging and thinking and hopefully they have some brain. <sighs> so coming back to the article, for instance, if you have a healthcare facility, having a chatbot for booking appointments and relaying basic information could reduce administrative burden. Absolutely. Or if you run an online fashion store, a multilingual chatbot could provide a personalized way to gather customer info and answer questions about clothing. Yep, definitely. Uh, okay, let's skip to the end. Getting started with chatbots and localizations. Localization services like multilingual chatbot localization can be an invaluable asset for your company. <clears throat> If localizing your website pages is not capturing all potential leads, you will need more multilingual customer service help and or your English only chatbot. It's not giving enough customer support. It's probably time to learn how to localize your chatbot. Before building a chatbot, consider the kinds of questions your customers typically have. To have an idea of how to localize your chatbot, segment those questions by language and market. This way you can address unique needs in each country. When building the chatbot, begin with routine queries. This is a very good point. Your multilingual chatbot will de deliver value more quickly by automating standard issues. Nice. Once the system proves it can handle routine customer needs, train for more complex interactions. Yes, great. This is again the same approach as we covered in episode seven, which is to be more lean, uh, experiment, and don't just blow all your money to localize everything at once. Ultimately, a multilingual chatbot can be an integral, integral, integral part of any localization strategy. And you can benefit in the long run from increased ability to handle customer needs across all sorts of languages. <clears throat> So this was an article from dynamiclanguage.com. I really like it. I will not inspect their website because where am I? Uh, 53 minutes. Okay. So that was article number two. Article number three is I found this on a site called I found this on Twitter, but it was linking to this page, which is ME daily. And the site is Mesa aliens, and I think it's a uh, media and entertainment. And so this is an article by Scott Rose, he's a CDO for SDI media. So this is kind of like a <clears throat> this is kind of like a sponsored content, I would say because it's basically about their new app, which is about growing the localization talent pool. And uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm just quickly going to try to skim through this one. Okay, I'm here because I had to I couldn't just skim the article because <clears throat> I was trying to find something that I could share. And I was thinking like, hmm, maybe this is too long, maybe I should skip it. But here I am, and I'll try to do my best. So first, they introduce a problem saying that uh, the original content in the marketplace which is driven by platforms such as Netflix, Amazon Prime, iTunes and Hulu <clears throat> has put a strain or on dubbing resources. This is true not only in major markets such as fix, but also in emerging markets such as Poland, Hungary and Thailand. 
This train is not limited to just voice actors, in, it impacts script adapters, directors, lyricists, and engineers who work in local production or are fresh out of university and have not really figured out a career path that involves entertainment localization. How do you find the next generation of talent and how do you make it easy for them to choose that path? <clears throat> so, SDI Media and two people from that company, Alberto Abiso and Olenka Pelczynska, probably Polish, decided to try something new to solve the talent gap and launch a project aimed at creating a transparent and self-enabled global dubbing community. What emerged from this effort is an app called ProDub. So what they want to do is they want to create a community. And they say that by creating an online community where actors, singers, directors, lyricists, translators and engineers can upload their resumes and voice samples, see what projects are upcoming and applicable, share feedback on opportunities and forward information to colleagues, we move away from old school processes managed in silo, silos and enter a world of collaboration, transparency and efficient engagement. Product subscribers can receive notifications when new projects become available, review scheduled auditions or peruse breaking industry news. To further increase transparency, Product also offers our clients visibility to the talent recruitment process that they can follow so that they can follow the progress of a new project. The Prodap app is geo-filtered and created in local languages to allow for variations in workflow and demand across each language territory. It was first launched in Poland and the uptake has been remarkable, quickly growing to thousands of subscribers. A rollout to further territories is scheduled with Germany next, closely followed by the Nordic countries. The increase in original content and shrinking deadlines has resulted in competent translators having more choices in what they work on and how they work. All things being equal, a translator who has five jobs to choose from may simply take one from the localization company that offers the most seamless and user-friendly experience. The incentive is ease of engagement, instantaneous access to work materials and immediate delivery of translations from anywhere in the world. Cloud-based connected workspaces have become the norm for subtitling creation as they provide efficiency not only for engaging resources and providing work materials, but also for evolving the essence of translations from files to data. A data-centric approach in a centralized platform not only gives full control over the status and output of the task, but also allows vendors to more efficiently recruit, test and train new resources while simultaneously onboarding them into the system. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm not very happy about this content that I just provided because like, I was just <clears throat> reading I'm not very good at reading, especially now. <laughs> and what I, what I notice right now is that I don't know how to breathe during reading. <laughs> anyway, going back to this, I'm thinking that this one has maybe this one is more specialized, because right now I'm looking at the website of the of the actual app. And that is pro dub dot app. <clears throat> and their value proposition is join the dubbing community. So they are seem to be very focused on uh, the voice actors. <clears throat> so enter the world of movies and TV series, work with us on big productions, you decide what project you become a part of from now on. So first of all, their website is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> To put it simply, they they have like few colors. They have orange as the one that's like um, standing out. Otherwise, it's kind of like blackish, grayish, and white. 
but it looks super clean. I like it really. It's 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 just great. <clears throat> so who is this for? So Produp is an application for film production professionals. This is for vocalists, actors, editors, directors, translators, sound engineers, dialogue writers, and lyricists. It's funny that their uh, value proposition started by saying join the dubbing community, but then there are more people involved. But I don't know much about <clears throat> dubbing because the only time that we did dubbing was that you just create the script and then you send it to the studio, which may might have been actually SDI media. <clears throat> when I was working on Otis project, who knows? Anyway, uh, do it your way. So you can create your profile, you get offers, and you tell us your location. Okay, so where you want to do the recordings. There are more screenshots from the app, and I really like the app as well. Uh, stay up to date, be the first to know about auditions in your area, you get notifications, and there are also news, there's a news section. You'll never miss another development in the world of movies and TV series. <clears throat> Create a community. That's another feature. Or more like a benefit. Tight knit team. Thanks to our application, you decide who you want to work with. So I guess this is the usual like, kind of like um, a review system like from Airbnb. I guess we're like for, for most of these like Uber, stuff like that, you can always rate the other person that you work with. And there's also some networking, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, then there's a video and that's the end of the landing page. So I really like it. Okay. Um, but anyway, I couldn't provide a lot of extra information for this one. So but I think I'll be able to do that for the last two articles that I have. <clears throat> And actually, <laughs> it's only the first thing that's an actual article, the last thing is kind of like a surprise. Uh, so let's first start with the, the article. This is again, another new company. And it's clear words, translations, and they made this article uh, about freelance translators or translation agency, which is better for your business. So let's get into it. Unfortunately, there's no universal answer to this question. Mostly it depends on the scope of your translation project, and how quickly you need things done. True. There aren't only these aren't all <laughs> these aren't the only elements to consider. However, your budget, the type of translation services needed, and the industry in which you operate will influence your decision as well. So here we go. Let's look at the advantages of working with a freelance translator. <clears throat> so number one, you have direct communication with a translator. So when hiring a freelance translator, you'll be able to communicate directly with a person who does the translation, he or she is the project manager, the virtual assistant and the expert that chooses the best terms to describe each concept. With a direct line, miscommunication is less likely to occur, reducing the risk for translation errors. So I mean, okay, if you have a small, very small project, and you want to or like very few languages, maybe then it's okay to have this as the first benefit of working with translators directly. But if you're managing bigger things, then you definitely don't want to be dealing with all the translators <clears throat> directly. <sighs> Advantage number two, the freelancer is usually cheaper than agency. <clears throat> Working with an individual instead of a company costs less, costs less, and you don't necessarily need to sacrifice quality. That's true. But then of course, 
<clears throat> if you are dealing with an agency that hopefully does more languages at the same time, they all, that also means that you're going to probably save some money on having your own internal project manager. Of course, that depends on where you actually would hire that person because like having a project manager in the US would cost a lot more than having someone somewhere else. <clears throat> and you get to choose your expert. With freelancers, you have control over the hiring process. You get to select whom you work with based on references, job interviews, or any other method you consider relevant. Of course, that means you'll work harder to find the right match compared to an agency where they choose the experts for you and you rarely have the chance to choose your team. So I don't think this is actually true because like, <clears throat> and this, and this um, depends on how how active you want to be if you are like a buyer and you work with LSP. I'm sure like if they want your business and you tell them that, hey, I want to actually pick the people that we work on our projects, uh, then then they won't reject. And there are actually many cases where uh, the buyer, usually typically a bigger company would start consolidating and minimizing their localization team. And if in the past they had like their favorite translators, then they would go to the LSP and tell, hey, tell them, hey, you guys need to use these translators, please do that. <clears throat> and then it's done. So it means you if you want to, you can still choose your own experts. <clears throat> so I don't agree with this. Uh, the benefits of working with a translation agency. So that's the second part. <sighs> okay, let's look at it, you get fast turnarounds. The larger the language service provider, the bigger its team of translators. If you have large projects to handle and are already running out of time, a translation agency can find the right people. That's true. <clears throat> they have an updated database with translators, linguists and language experts who can step in immediately and help you meet the, your deadlines. That is probably true. Although, if they have this big pool, and for some reason, you require something very fast, it means they might have to reach out to people <clears throat> in their pool who have absolutely no previous experience with your projects. <clears throat> and so by requesting super fast or not usual turnaround times, you might actually end up getting worse quality. Of course, you should be if you are as a client, if you are um, uh, comfortable with that, then by all means, go ahead. But ideally, you want to stick to the same pool of people. <laughs> okay, next one, you receive more than simple translations, agencies provide a wide range of services within the industry, from localization and transcreation, international SEO, 
and other technical services, you can benefit from their experience in more ways than one. They have the experience and infrastructure in place to help you overcome language and cultural barrier barriers. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, if you have anything more complex, you either need like your own engineer, or again, you would go to LSP that can do everything. If you want more technical stuff, like I don't know, SEO, and uh, then probably you would again need to go to uh, an LSP. And if you want to do something that we that uh, we discussed in episode seven, which is like very lean approach <clears throat> to localization, measuring the ROI, doing experiments, then that's something that you would not get from most of the translators, I would say. <clears throat> and next one, agencies have trained project managers for increased efficiency. Most of the time agencies will assign you a project manager, true, who will go above and beyond to make sure you get the best value for your money. Oh, this is such a cheesy line. Oh, it's making me want to cut myself. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, like everybody has project managers. But man, I'm telling you guys, the difference between project managers that I have met is huge is huge. And I will definitely be doing some more videos on the topic of project management and and you'll see. <laughs> uh, you can start right away. That's another benefit of the agency. And this is what they say. Freelance translators, especially the good ones often have their services booked for months in advance. So you might have to wait before getting your translations. True. On the other hand, agencies are available right when you need them thanks to their large number of collaborators. <clears throat> Not true because even agencies could be booked if they have limited pools of translators. And maybe if they don't have limited pools of translations, maybe they have shitty translator translators in their pools, who knows. Agencies implement rigorous quality checks. Uh, it has nothing to do with translator skills, but with workflows and protocol inside a translation agency. Even the most skilled translator can make mistakes, but agencies have a proofreading system in place that can detect errors in real time. Uh, yeah, kind of okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, okay, so here, here, final two chapters. Roughly speaking, you should work with a freelance translator when you're a small company that needs some language related consultancy for context or short translations. In this case, the skills of a highly specialized legal translator could fit much better than any agency. I think I agree. You only need to translate your documents or website into one or two languages, in which case putting together a small team of freelancers could be cheaper than hiring an agency and its army of experts. Mm, I'm not convinced about this one because it means you would need to prepare everything and you would need to run the project on your own. Especially like if you're, if you're doing documents that maybe if you're doing a website, you would need to figure out like how to get the strings translated. <clears throat> and that might not be that easy. Although probably like with all these continuous localization tools that we are discovering on this podcast, maybe they could set it up for you. And then you could just use their TMS and you could just, I don't know, sit down and relax and look at the dashboard. <clears throat> Number three, you have to stretch every dollar. In this case, working with freelancers may be better than hiring agencies. Again, 
not convinced about is because like if you're in US and somebody needs to run the localization, then they're spending their time and that is basically the indirect cost of localization for you. While you might want to consider finding someone cheaper somewhere that could hopefully do a good job and manage the whole process for you. Final thoughts from the article. Some projects are simply too big to be handled by a freelancer or a team of individuals who have no previous experience working together. True. When you need multi language support and have set rigorous deadlines, an agency can help you meet your business goals. They're reliable and work well, reliable, okay, maybe some of them, <clears throat> and work fast thanks to their experience and significant resources. Some of them don't work fast, trust me. And when it comes to innovation, the big guys are fucking slow. Depending on the size of your projects, you may even choose to work both with agency and freelancers. Hmm, interesting. There's no one size fits all model. So see which way works better for your company and stick with it. Okay, dokey. So that was the last article. And it's one hour 20 minutes. I think this might actually be the longest podcast that I've ever done. Because we're getting to the final part. And I think I think it was episode six that I talked about entertainment localization. So this last thing will be a little bit entertaining. It was definitely entertaining for me. So as I was going through all the hashtag localization tweets on Twitter, I found this interesting thing. It's a tweet that says this following localizing your translation can make the biggest difference when approaching international clients. Localizing your translation. This is the first time ever in my life and in my whole career that I see someone saying something like this to localize a translation. That's so weird. And what is even more weird is that the company that put this out is simply called the translation company. <laughs> so yes, this is just so weird. I don't know why they're called that way. And why they're selling saying that you need to localize your translations. I mean, like, what the fuck? Like, why would you get someone to translate something and only then you would localize it? Like, hello. <laughs> and this is actually in their image. This is the text or the quote or whatever. To localize your translation means to adapt your translation to fit the local language, culture and conditions. I mean, that's localization, right? But we're adapting source, not translation. I mean, what the fuck? Uh, and so I'm going to dig a little bit deeper because uh, these guys are something unique. So I'm looking right now I'm looking at their Twitter account. So their description is the translation company group LLC provides professional translation services with quality you can trust. All right. <laughs> um, so the first thing when I'm looking at their tweets is that their branding and that their um, how do you guys call is it is it just branding? Basically, like their visual style of the images they put on Twitter is like so inconsistent, like they are different, there are different fonts. I think the colors are off. Like the thumbnails are like, totally, totally inconsistent. <sighs> oh my god, okay. Okay, so now I'm going to their website, which is 
thetranslationcompany.com um, <laughs> uh, So, they have a carousel. Is that the right term? I know it is, but I don't know if I'm pronouncing it the right way. So that's basically like the, how is it called? Uh, above the fault thing, you know, the first thing that you see on the website under the menu. <clears throat> and so that one is about what they do. They do life sciences, uh, they do technical translations, they do legal services and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I guess, okay. What I wanted to say was like, this is like, like just like the list of industries. So it's not like screaming like, hey, this is the benefit that you'll get when you work with us. This is more like, hey, we also localize, we can translate legal, we can translate technical and blah, blah, blah. And the next part is they have, actually they put their uh, clients below the ISO compliant um, what is it image or something. Then they're also like accredited business and they're a member of American Translators Association. So they put all of these things above their clients, which I think is, I don't know, maybe I'm maybe it's just me because like all these ISO things and I'm a member of this and this and that to me, like, I don't give a crap. But if you have like, interesting customers, I think that's more valuable uh, for me as a potential customer. Okay, let's scroll down. They provide quality human translation. Watch out for that. And so they have these <laughs> images of their management team. And yeah, I'm not going to comment on them. <laughs> It's like a typical, you know, like corporate. Um, yeah, but the CEO looks nice. She looks like Filipino. Um, okay, <laughs> I guess I lost all the credit now because I'm basically looking at how people look like. But you know, like this is like my, I always fucking hate like all these corporate profiles, you know, like people in nice suits with their fucking fake Hollywood smiles, you know, it's like, it's just like polish, you know, and it's so fake. It's like, people are not like that, like in reality. That's why I always like, like profiles, like about us pages, like for startups, you know, because the people are like dressed like normal people or like they do funny faces and stuff like that. These people are just like, yeah, we are so serious, blah, blah, blah. And then what you provide is that you localize translations. Oh, oh my God. So the next part of their website is reviews from Yelp, from Google and from Facebook, which to me gives a signal like these guys are maybe doing like a lot of uh, translations for, uh, for consumers, like from people from the street versus like for like B2B. I don't know. It's confusing. And this part, this is this is like the <laughs> this is so funny. So the next section of the website and I'm still on the homepage is that they have 500 plus professional translators. And then they they have these images. It's like it's like a grid of 4 by 2. <laughs> and they have these images of people who are supposedly their translators and what language they speak and where they are. And the first time I saw this, <laughs> and especially because as I'm scrolling it down, there's like this live chat link, like hovering on the right side and that's scrolling with the page. So this to me looks definitely like, like some uh, live chat, you know, like a chatter bait or something like that. So <laughs> I really thought like this was like so funny and right next to it, and I'm actually, I'm actually wondering if these people are actually real, like in these images. But anyway, next to these four people, I mean, sorry, four times two, you know, that's the grid of these uh, translators. Then there's an image that says more than 200 plus languages translated at the translation company group. And the image that they have there, that's like some old school stock 
image. I don't know. It's so weird. Industry focus. That's the next section. This part looks kind of nice. Uh, so they're focusing on business translation, technology translation, lingual translation, technical translation. Mm. Although in the background it looks like construction, so I'm not sure if it actually is. It actually doesn't match what is in the front. Uh, so the background image doesn't match. Moving on. <laughs> Translations for more than 200 languages. Okay, that's fine. Why Why choose us? Okay, let's see. 100% satisfaction guaranteed. Okay, best quality price ratio. Uh, we beat any written quotes from any US translating company member of the ATA on a comparable English, Spanish or Chinese translation project. Okay, short turnarounds. We are happy to handle overnight and rush translation jobs to help you meet challenging turnaround requirements. Okay, and then there's contact us. So it looks like they have offices in New York, San Francisco and Dallas. And actually because hmm, so this was the home page. Uh, let me look at the about us page. If it has like any story. Oh, it has. The translation company group has quickly risen to the forefront of the translation and localization business since its inception in 2005. Well, I'm not sure if they're at the for forefront. This is the first time that I hear about them. Our teams are veterans of hundreds of translation and localization projects, having worked for clients of all sizes and needs. We believe that translating content for other markets is just a piece of the puzzle. Competing Com uh, sorry, competitive advantage and success in foreign markets is achieved by a cohesive treatment of all the aspects related to your content. By content, we mean not only text, but graphics, web media such as apps, news sites, blogs, and any traditional media your customers may use. Uh, okay, boring. Uh, it's like, hey, we not only translate text, but also graphics and websites. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I'm actually bored. <laughs> um, what I'm curious about, and this is the last uh, step that I'm going to do into this company, the translation company, and I want to see their reviews by their um, they have nice reviews on Trustpilot, but I want their Glassdoor reviews. Glassdoor reviews. <clears throat> oh, oh, wait, what? Uh, so mm, isn't the one because this one only has two reviews. Yeah, it looks like I found the one. And this one only has two reviews. So it's not very valid. Wonderful people on ownership, the CEO is smart. Con consentious and caring individual cons the company is still growing and some patience required as they expand. Okay, I guess that's it. Well, so this is the first time, ladies and gentlemen, that we meet a company that offers localization of translation. So if by any chance any of you are doing just translation, you know where to go, go to the translation company, <laughs> the translation company.com and ask them if they could localize your translation. If you actually need to do this, you probably suck. And you shouldn't be listening to this podcast anyway. Okay, and I think I covered everything I needed. It's 18 minutes past midnight. Oh my god. I think I slept only six hours two days ago and like five hours last night. So it's time for me to stop this. And I really enjoy this one. I still didn't finish my beer. And okay, I don't want to prolong this. Anyway, so this was episode eight, with a bunch of articles from the previous week. 
I may release this one over the weekend, just to see or maybe I'll save it for the next Tuesday in case I mess up in Philippines. And I overbook my dates. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Anyway, thank you for listening. If you got to this point, shout out to you. I mean, good job, respect. I appreciate it a lot. I actually don't think that anyone um, survives listening to me for one hour and 30 minutes. But if you got to this point, please just send me a message wherever, find me on social, uh, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Anyway, if you got this and you're reading this, uh, I mean, sorry, if you're listening to this, respect, respect, let me know you are my hardcore fan. <laughs> and with that said, I'm going to turn this recording off. Enjoy your life. Don't be stupid. And talk to you next week. Bye.